Hello there, and uh, welcome to CAR PolicyCast, the show where we engage with experts and stakeholders to discuss pressing questions to the cutting edge of uh, ADR. And today's guest is Annette Magnusson, and uh, Ms. Magnusson is the Secretary General of the Arbitration Institute at the Stockholm Chamber of Commerce. She has previously been affiliated with Interalia, the uh, Swedish Anti-Corruption Anti Institute, and the law firm Mannheim & Saki in Baker McKenzie. Um, she's a lawyer by trade and holds an LLM degree from Stockholm University. If I may be so presumptuous um, to use your first name, Annette, welcome to the show. Thank you, Ludwig, and thank you for having me. No, no, of course, it's our pleasure. Um, I was just wondering if you mind telling our viewers a little bit about your role at the SEC um, and the kind of disputes that you specialize in. Sure. So at the Arbitration Institute of the Stockholm Chamber of Commerce, we do both commercial and investor state disputes. And we have been around for a long time. We celebrated our centennial in 2017. And we have had an international caseload since the 1970s. Uh, and we do mostly uh, commercial arbitration, uh, about 200 cases per year annually, with about half of our cases from uh, international parties and the other half domestic cases. But like I also mentioned, we do a fair number of investor state cases. And this might be something that puts us apart a little bit if you compare with other international commercial arbitral institutions. Um, given the fact that there are, as far as we know, about 120 bilateral investment treaties uh, in addition to the Energy Charter Treaty that include a role for the SEC or Sweden in the investor state dispute resolution provisions under the treaty. So that means that we have uh, handled a fair number of investor state cases here at the SEC and do on an annual basis. So that's sort of uh, the two main categories of cases that we see. And if you would uh, look at sort of the substantive issues of the cases, we have a fair number of energy cases here in Stockholm. And traditionally, if you look at our international uh, commercial caseload, we have had where you could say that it originated from an east-west um, trade and east-west dispute. So in the 1970s, when the United States and the Soviet Union decided to, to uh, appoint the Stockholm Chamber of Commerce as a fora for their uh, dispute resolution processes, this sort of set the scene for the development in Stockholm. And uh, against this background, uh, we still see a large number of east-west disputes in Stockholm. So that's sort of the, uh, the crash course of the, what we do here at the SSE. Well, thank you so much for, for, for the backstory and the insight into the, the, uh, the Chamber of Commerce arbitration business side. Um, just kind of to expand on that, uh, how would you like to see the, the arbitration industry develop in the years to come? Um, and how would you hope to kind of influence this development? And, and um, um, if I may, I'm thinking specifically kind of within the areas of um, arbitration, digitalization and arbitration and climate change. I think there are a number of factors in the world around us that we really ne need to sort of um, be aware of as, a, as an arbitral institution. I think first and foremost, what we see at the institutions is a reflection of the world around us. And what we have seen in recent years as a consequence of the globalization is an increased uh, level of complexity and connectivity around the world in the way business is being done. And this is also reflected in the cases that we have to handle. Uh, and this, uh, for example, pours out in the time and cost of uh, international arbitration cases. And this is an important discussion to have and an impor important issue to address. And Digitalization certainly offers a lot of opportunity for international arbitration, including for, for the institutions. And currently, I think we are at an interesting point in time, certainly a very challenging point in time. We are in the middle of a pandemic. Um, the spring here has been, um, has, has been unprecedented for, for many people. Um, and for, for some people, very, very tragic. So it's, it's a very, very special time for all of us. One thing that we have seen uh, in international arbitration is that developments when it comes to digitalization that perhaps had we not had the pandemic would have been given six months or even years to develop in terms of moving into a new tech environment. These developments now had to take place in a matter of days. Otherwise, cases could not move forward, tribunals could not be working, parties and their counsel could not be bringing their cases forward in the, uh, in the proceedings. So everything had to happen at a very fast pace. And what we discovered here is that 
our community is very adaptive. People um, really made it work. Um, and there was an openness to adopting to new procedures and using this technology that has really been around for a long time. But there has been sort of hesitancy of actually moving into that digital space. Well, now we had to. And we discovered um, it worked. We discovered that parties and their council are willing and able to do so. And we discovered that tribunals may, we may well hold a hearing in a virtual environment. So I think there is an opportunity here to use the COVID-19 momentum, if you want to call it that, mm. to further digitalize um, international arbitration. I'm not saying that we should sort of have a default rule uh, going forward that everything should be virtual or online. So I think also after this pandemic has passed, we will have physical hearings and we will meet in person. Thank, <laughs> I'm thankful for that because I do miss meet, meeting people in person. But I do think we, this um, level of uh, maturity when it comes to using the new uh, opportunities offered by digitalization will stay. Hmm. And that will make our work better and more efficient uh, in the future. Yeah, I'm happy to hear you say that because um, CAR, we recently um, released our remote hearings guidance note um, in which we set out um, sort of, we stake out the mission that, that the business shouldn't be burdened by, um, well, they shouldn't be subjected to undue burdens because of the limited ability to meet physically. Um, so in, in your opinion, if, if, you, if you wouldn't mind, um, especially adhering to the matter of collecting reliable testimonies, um, what are some of your biggest concerns or the challenges you think with, with converting to remote hearings in a larger part than, than before? I think one of the issues that we need to be aware of, if you're looking at a, the bigger picture, is that there, the, the, um, uh, the access to, um, to the new tools is not equally spread around the world. So it's, we may take for granted in our part of the world that you, you always have a very uh, well-functioning connection with very uh, large band, bandwidth so you can uh, work efficiently and you have all the, uh, the hardware easily accessible. Whereas that might not always be the case all over the world. So I think you need, there needs to be an awareness of what is the, what is the access to the new technology, uh, including both from a sort of an international and global scale, but also in the individual case that is being heard uh, to make sure that um, the equal treatment of the parties in the case includes the equal access to the tools that are assumed to be used in the case. So I think there needs to be certainly um, caution and awareness of that matter. From what I have heard and from what I have seen from discussions this spring, there is that awareness of the, not least tribunals hearing the cases. But I think that's something that we need to be aware of. It's easy to sit here in Sweden and I think that the level of um, tech savviness that we see here or the uh, access to technology is the same everywhere, but it's not. So we have to be aware of that. So that would be something just to keep in mind and may potentially raise a flag for. Um, and again, I, I think that we need to maintain our flexibility and maintain always be open to say, okay, what is the best solution here? Is it actually an online ver um, solution here? Should we go virtual? Or could this actually be a situation now that we can, but we should meet in person? So just to have an open mind and not be binary, so to speak, that there is always the, either one or the other. You know, you have to have a binary, a non-binary um, approach to the planning of the case. Uh, in terms of uh, IRL and virtual. Yeah, thank you, Annette. That's, that's very insightful. Um, harking back to the notion that, that you mentioned, that you brought up, it's, it's actually ex an, an, an excellent segue because um, talking about inclusiveness and, and equal opportunity, um, I wanted to ask you about diversity in dispute resolution. And if, if you think that we could do more to improve diversity in the um, dispute resolution and the ADR profession in general, um, and maybe more specifically where you do or where the SCC stand on the issue? So the short answer, of course, to that question is yes. Uh, we can do more. We can all do more. 
we have been quite focused on diversity at the SSC in, from a gender perspective in recent years. So we have been involved, for example, in the Equal Representation and Arbitration Pledge. We now have um, uh, in the guidelines to the SSC board when it comes to the appointment of arbitrators, um, we now have included in those guidelines or in this policy uh, a reminder of the fact that the SSC is a signatory to the pledge and the fact that this is the thing that should be considered when names are proposed for uh, appointments as arbitrator under the SSC rules. So certainly that awareness has increased. And if you look at the numbers uh, here in Stockholm, um, the, um, the balance between men and women sitting as arbitrator uh, has become better. Um, there is still a way to go, but certainly it has become better in the, if you would look back the past five years or so. So there, I think the, the focus is, is certainly there although we have not sort of reached the finish line yet uh, when it comes to the balance. Um, now, diversity obviously is more than gender. And I do think here we have the next challenge for us to, to reach out to a wider group of specialists in the world, um, to have them be involved uh, both at international arbitration at large and most certainly at arbitration under the SSC rules. Um, so that's sort of uh, something that we need to figure out how we can expand um, our, um, our network, our knowledge um, in that vast pool of experts that we are not yet familiar with, but that I know are out there. Um, we, um, so this is something that I, where we need to get better for sure. Um. Is the um, SSC currently running any specific initiatives that you could kind of delve into um, that work towards these ends? So like I mentioned, the, the, the pledge initiative, we are uh, certainly supporting that and I'm on the steering committee of the, of the pledge. Um, and when it comes to uh, diversity from a more uh, cultural or geographical standpoint, we have um, not taken any specific initiatives because it's certainly on our radar when we um, receive invitations to be part of international conferences, international initiatives. Um, we are very fortunate. We get uh, a number of invitations and, and so many that we, we have difficulties really um, responding to, to all of them. But then that could be an element, okay, where what kind of involvement would give us a good opportunity to expand that network uh, and to engage in conversations with people that we might not have known before, with new experts. So that's certainly something that we uh, keep in mind in, in those situations. Thank you so much for that. Um, yes, can, kind of sort of continuing on the uh, on challenges to the industry. Um, I wanna, of course, like anyone else, um, talk about the pandemic. Um, and especially how ADR and, and dispute resolution kind of fits into the scope of, of, of the pandemic. Um, and I, I wanted to ask you um, how the SEC has adapted to the new requirements of the current era uh, that we're in right now and, and, and how you think that there might be institutional changes and lessons that will stay with us even after this, this, um, this phase um, of, the, of the virus in this era is, is bygone. We have already touched upon the issue of digitalization and, and the use of virtual tools. And again, that's, that's a certainly a very concrete consequence if you look at the practice of international arbitration that we are all experiencing at the institution, uh, with counsel, uh, with arbitrators. So that's certainly a very concrete outcome. And, uh, and, and I think that's something that we will see uh, again going forward. And I, at the SSC, we, we have had, uh, a complete uh, electronic case management system in place uh, for many years since since 2013. So, for us, when we all, everyone moved home and started working remotely, that was really um, not a big thing. It was very easily done uh, from one day to the other. Uh, it happened very quickly. We had to take the decision, decision very quickly, and it it was just went very smoothly. And all in all, the, it has been a strange spring because. It has been filled with all of these contradictions, I find. So on the, on the one hand, it is business as usual. We're all sitting in at home uh, and, and doing our job. But on the other hand, nothing is the same if you look outside in society and in the world at large. So it's, it's that contradiction of business as usual and nothing is the same. Uh, and at the same time, uh, we are distanced from each other. Um, 
and we, we don't see many people. And certainly that was even more true if you would go back two months or so. But at the same time, we get even closer because uh, we sit uh, and zoom into with one another. We check in with one another, um, both at the sort of um, office level. We have more regular meetings um, and just to, to check in our work, but also to check how everyone is doing but also between colleagues uh, at other offices, at other Aboriginal institutions, in other countries. So we, have, we are more distant, uh, but we are also closer. That's also a, a very sort of a strange uh, contradiction that I've seen this spring. Um, and I do think one thing that is important, an important takeaway from this spring, which is not unique for international arbitration. Um, I think it goes for all of society, regardless of what organization you are in, is that has really tested leadership. Um, they say that diamonds form under pressure, right? Mm. So it has really tested leadership at all levels of society, um, including, of course, uh, for us as an institution, both in in the institution as such, but also when it comes to our role as an institution within the community. Um, and we found that many tribunals and parties, they expected the institutions to lead. Um, and this is um, an observation not only from the SSC, but also in conversations with other arbitral institutions. Parties and, and council and tribunals, they look for the institutions to lead and for guidance in this uncertain situation that uh, established itself in March, April around there when uh, different uh, country after country went into lockdown. Um, and I think what we learned from that is that it's important to, to, um, to, um, to elaborate, to think, and to really take steps to, to uh, f uh, take that role as a leader. Um, so for example, um, in, uh, in April, uh, a, a number of arbitral institutions signed a joint statement just to give some guidance to, to the parties and council and tribunals out there on how, how we see uh, on this crisis and sort of encouraging tribunals to use the tools available under the rules so not to lose the momentum in the cases and encourage also to look for virtual options where, there, where that is doable. Um, and if the response was very positive. And I think the mere fact that the institutions, 12 institutions as it was at the time and since then many other institutions have confirmed that they agree with this joint message. The fact that so many institutions stand up and say, this is the way we look at the world given the challenges we are now facing that was very helpful for the community at large. And I think this was important to be able to demonstrate uh, leadership. Um, so that's, that's another sort of takeaway from this spring that it's important as an institution, uh, if you look at our community, that we do have the courage to lead. Hmm. No, I, I, I wholeheartedly agree with you. I, I, think, I think leadership as well, especially where, you know, in areas where it's lacking, it's, it's, a quite, it's, a, it's, it's quite evident. Um, that it matters. Um, and I mean, talking about the, just the, the pure kind of unfiltered uncertainty right now. Um, and the fact that we don't really know how to behave and we're kind of learning by doing and we're learning each day um, as we kind of go about a business. Would you say that um, we might face an increased reliance on ad hoc solutions um, in disputes in this time and, and perhaps even going forward a bit? Um, and, and can horizon scanning help ADR providers um, to, to stay relevant um, as we go forward? So I suppose it depends on what you mean with ad hoc solutions. I do think from, from if you look at the, the, the arbitral procedure, I think the spring has demonstrated the strength of institutional arbitration that you, you could look for the institutions for the guidance and, and, and also for practicalities. Like for example, here at, in Stockholm, we have, we have a digital platform for case management. It uh, was introduced in September last year, so very timely. So that's really sort of um, uh, another tool to help the tribunals and the parties manage the case, the SSC platform. So there you, you could see that there was um, certainly in my mind, a, an advantage to institutional arbitration. 
But by ad hoc, you could also mean uh, to have an open mind, to be agile in your sort of way of going about what you do and the way you take in the world. And I do think that will be important because so many unexpected things are happening. Uh, and even now, this uh, far into the pandemic, um, there are many uncertainties. We don't know yet where this will end and where it will take us. So we need to be prepared to um, do things perhaps next week in a way we didn't do it this week. So that sort of understanding of ad hoc certainly I think will be important. You need to have an, an open mindset um, and, and um, be the capability to manage things ad hoc for sure. Now this has been a great conversation on that. Thank you so much. And there's so many insights and I think both myself and the listeners need to kind of um, think about this for a while. But if, if just before we leave, um, would you mind to share one industry inside or, or, or uh, just um, some, an interesting fact or a nugget that you think the viewers um, does not know or kind of adhere to an issue that isn't getting enough time in the limelight? Um, would you mind sharing something like that with us and the viewers? Right. So if I would pick sort of one aspect of the discussion on international arbitration, which I do think merits potentially a um, little bit more attention, it is the fact that international arbitration is not a standalone system. I was talking a little bit about this at the beginning of our talk in the sense that um, what we see at the institutions is just a mere reflection of the world around us. And the world around us has been uh, characterized by globalization in recent years. Now, we don't know where the pandemic will take us also regarding that. Will we have regionalization to an increasing extent rather than globalization going forward? Who knows? But again, this, this, is, a, this is a consequence or this, is, this will have consequences for us. So just um, the, the recognition of uh, the complexities in the world around us, and that would also include uh, issues relating to new regulatory um, uh, requirements, um, issues relating to um, digitalization, which is sort of also, also regula regulatory, uh, like GDPR, cybersecurity, all of these sort of elements um, that defines the world around us. And we are but a mere uh, piece of the puzzle, if you like. We are not a standalone system. So I think um, understanding that uh, the where, where society is going will be visible in our caseload, but also have consequences for how cases are being heard uh, and decided. And in the end, how long it takes and how much it costs. Um, so I think the, the, the fact that the international arbitration is not a standalone system in society, but is re really deeply embedded in, in the economic life, that sort of uh, kind of discussions is something that I would welcome to see more of uh, going forward. Thank you so much, Annette. Um, that's very interesting, and, and, and I'm afraid this conversation has come to its natural conclusion here, uh, which is such a shame. But I just wanted to thank you on behalf of the Institute and, you know, from my point of view as well. Uh, thank you so much for coming on. It's been a pleasure having you here. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure also from my side. Of course. <laughs>